Good afternoon and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Tuberculosis and Bloodborne Pathogens for Clinic Managers. If you have a question about anything that we discuss today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and the email address are on your screen now and will appear again later on in the program. Also, the handouts, the sign-in sheets, the evaluations and are all available to you online. You will need to register for this program in order to access these materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and the evaluation tool. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses. And this will expire on June 30, 2016, and two years for social workers, which expires on June 30, 2017. I am Teresa Dix, and I'm one of the nurse educators with the Alabama Department of Public Health. And along with me today is Pam Barrett. She is the director of the TB division. And we also have Dawn Harris, she is the Area 5 and 6 TB Manager. Thank you for being with us and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. Today our objectives are going to be to become familiar with the new TB uh, protocol, how it's laid out. We're going to identify who actually gets T-spots and we're going to understand the implementation of the INH and rifapentine, which is also commonly known as 3-HP. Okay. In the new format, you're going to find that there are no appendices like before. Before, you had the appendices that were modified DOT plans, uh, drug serum levels. Now, those are all incorporated into the protocol, and they're easy to find. Um, also, you're going to see that the guidelines for treatment have been updated. No longer will you have a lot of repetition. You will have sections for revisit, for the initial visit, and they're easy to find. We also have new weight-based uh, medication tables, and they are not spread out over four pages. They're on one page, so once again, that's going to be easier on the eyes, and less mistakes will be made. All right. The protocol starts off with the introduction to TB. It is going to give us a definition of what TB is and what LTBI is. Also, it's going to cover should we get referrals from an outside provider, what we should do. If we do get referrals from an outside provider, we can honor those prescriptions sent in for a case or for LTBI. However, if they do not fall within our guidelines, our protocol, then we're going to consult our TB physician. However, also with that, if we get a referral from a physician and it is a low-risk patient, then consult the TB man manager and on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's how that's handled. All right. It is also going to tell you when you should notify the manager. Basically, any time you start a case, a suspect, a converter, any anyone on medication you need to identify, or, well, anyone you've identified that needs to start medication, you need to contact the area manager or TB staff. Okay. It's going to define what a suspect, a contact, a converter, and a reactor is. And it tells you who is recommended for routine screening. Basically, we do not do routine screening. However, health department employees who do treat patients, who come in direct contact with patients, they are recommended to have routine testing. All right. The visit standards are broken down into screening for T of TB contacts. Then you have this treatment of TB infection on the initial visit. It's going to tell you everything you do on the initial visit. Then you're going to have a revisit, everything you do on the revisit, and the same for TB disease. As far as the format goes for each of these, it states the purpose. It tells you which CHR forms that you are supposed to use. It tells you what assessment should be done. And it's going to tell you the treatment plan. It also will give you the medication uh, dosage chart. And one example right here is a medication dosage chart that is for our cases. This is for drug therapy. This is a tool that's going to be great to use. You can take a piece of paper. And let's just say that a person, let's say they weigh 98 pounds. 
You can just put a form across here. Up there, can't say it. Right there. There you go. And you can go straight across the line to see that they take INH 600, rifampin 450, PZA 2.0, and EMB 2.0. So this is a very good tool that we can use. Prior to now, it was on four pages, and, it, and it, there was some room for error there. Okay. T-spot and T TB testing. So who should receive a T-spot? Well, first off, all TB suspects or possibly the case or contacts to that TB case are who get tested. Now then, what's required for the T-spot? Let's slide this out. This form is what is the first requirement. Um, Oxford gives us these forms, and every area has them. You'll see at the top that it's designated per area. This is one for area six. What is highlighted are the areas that you must fill in. You must fill in the um, date of collection, the time collected. You must mark where it was AM or PM. You want the patient's name, their first name, last name, date of birth, patient ID, and then also underneath the Right here underneath the collection, it gives you the parameters as to how much blood that you need to draw. So not, it's a working tool, actually. So you will fill out one of these for each blood tube that you draw. The exception is going to be, as far as on tubes, is going to be somebody who is immunocompromised. You're going to want to draw two tubes on them, but it's still going to be one form that goes with that. Okay. Now, our STD-dedicated clinics can... Uh, test our newly diagnosed HIV patients, but those dedicated clinics are Jefferson, Madison, Mobile, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa County Health Departments. That's an exception. Okay, and then as far as a newly diagnosed HIV patient, the DIS with STD will be primarily responsible for drawing the T-spot, and that's going to be in association with the STD program manager. All right. And as far as the procedure for drawing the blood, you are going to draw one, top, one green top tube of a lithium heparin tube per patient. However, like I said before, if they're immunocompromised, two tubes. The tubes come in different sizes. You can order the 9 mil size, and that will cover all age groups, and you can use one tube. However, should you have any questions, feel free to ask your TB staff. They should know the answer, and if not, they'll find out. As far as labeling the blood, you're going to want to make sure that the patient's name and their date of birth, the date the specimen was collected, and the time that the specimen was collected is on that tube. The identifier can be their date of birth. You're going to notice on the form it tells you identifier. However, the identifier can be their date of birth. It can be a phone number. If they have a county chart, it can actually be the CHR number in the county. Okay. Once the blood is drawn, it needs to be kept at room temperature. You do not want to refrigerate it, and it needs to be shipped the same day that it was drawn. Um, we can arrange for FedEx Express pickup. And here's how you do that. And this is listed in the protocol now. It tells you what number to call, and it gives you the guideline as, what, as to what to say when you do call. I'm not going to read through that. Okay. Uh, INH and rifapentine, also known as 3HP, it is a great new formula that we are using. We're seeing good results. Um, we have had three patients that we've had great success. They liked it. We liked it. And we assured doses were taken, and that's a great thing. So basically with 3HP, first off, you consult the manager to make sure that, they are, that we're aware that 3HP has been ordered and that you're going to start it. And with 3HP, it is mandatory DOT. They get one dose once a week for 12 weeks. In general, in thinking about your doses, we tend to lean on Tuesdays when we do our doses for the simple fact Monday and Friday holidays sometimes come into play, and Tuesday is a day that it gives us a day after if, we, if they don't come in on Tuesday that we can find them on Wednesday to give them the medication. Now with 3-HP, you cannot give it to children that are less than 12 years of age. 
You cannot give it to people who are HIV positive and they're taking antiretroviral treatment. And people who are infected with resistant type of TB with INH and rifampin, they cannot take it. Um, people who are contact to those, that type of resistance, pregnant women or children under the age of 12. And here's the protocol as far as for 3-HP. Um, you can see that a person who weighs more than 111 pounds, their dosage is going to be 900 milligrams of INH and 900 milligrams of rifapentine. That's going to be uh, nine tablets altogether. However, once a week, it's much easier than taking one pill once a day for six months. And two, we can ensure that they complete their therapy do by doing that. And then we can show, may I have the protocol please? Yes. Thank you. All right. I would like to show a few examples of backing up to the format. The format of this protocol is all based, they're all laid out like this. It gives you the purpose. It tells you testing. It tells you the forms that you're supposed to use. This is something we haven't had before. And so this is real good. It tells you specifically. So your clinic nurse doesn't necessarily have to call in the TB staff and ask specifically what forms they're supposed to use. It's all right here. And in this one, testing procedures and treatment according to the outcome, it tells you what you should do once you get the outcome. And then, there we go. You have tables throughout. So you'll have written instruction and you'll have the table that follows. And then, Pam. Do you have anything to add? We're through. Um, we're talking a little bit more about the 3-HP regimen. Um, this is a, a new regimen that um, has been FDA approved for actually for children above age 2. And I just realized that that um, age probably needs to be changed in the protocol because we are um, now giving it to children that are over age 2. Um, Mississippi has actually started doing the 3-HP on um, almost all of their uh, TB contacts and has had a great um, uh, completion of therapy results with that and um, it's really encouraging the rest of the United States to um, do that. We in Alabama, um, Donna uh, said she's had a few patients. They, not everyone in the state is doing it yet, um, but the, the Patients seem to really like it a lot more, even though it is uh, DOPT, simply because they only have to worry about taking the medicine once a week, and it is only for um, four months instead of for the um, six months that most people are used to with the INH. Okay. Um, and, and it's DOT. There's no other way to give that medication other than DOT. That's that correct, correct. With the uh, with the three. So unless they're willing to participate in the DOT. They either have to come into the clinic or we do the home visit. Okay. And most of the people have come into the clinic. I think mm -hmm. we've only DOT'd one person in the field in our area that has showed great success. They liked it. They did not have side effects from it. Um, they enjoyed taking medicine once a week and not having to remember to take a pill every day. That's mm -hmm. been the plus side for mm -hmm. most of our patients who mm -hmm. were doing this. Are, are there any special nursing considerations that the nurses need to know when patients are on this particular medicine? Anything they need Instead to... of doing a monthly assessment, they need to do that nursing assessment at each visit once a week. Okay. They okay. Do. So we're not, we're not looking for anything specific to, like, checking vision with charts and those types of things like no. we've traditionally done in the past? No. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for being willing to share your knowledge base and keeping us up to date on the, uh, the new protocol for TB. We appreciate that very much. Thank We're you. Just very, very glad that we could finally get it. If you have out questions there. regarding the tuberculosis program that we have covered today, please feel free to email those in and we will get you an answer. If uh, information is in reference to pediatric tuberculosis, as you will recall, Dr. Landers did a program on pediatric 
uh, tuberculosis back in March. So if that is an area of interest to you, feel free to go back and pick up that program. We're going to move on with uh, the part of the program, Infection Control, for uh, the areas that we need to cover as far as what we do in our annual infection control program. And let's take a moment today with the review of the content on the chain of infection. There is a specific chain and each chain has a specific role or place in the, in the chain of infection. We begin by looking at the, uh, the reservoir host. That is the place where the micro, right, microorganisms reside and usually thrives and reproduces there. We move next to the portal of exit. The portal of exit is where the organism leaves the reservoir, usually by way of the respiratory tract or through some body fluids. The next link in the chain is through the mode of transmission. The mode of transmission is the means in which the organism transfers from one carrier to another. Once you move from the route of transmission, you move to the portal of entry, which is where there is an opening of where the disease enters another host's body, such as like the mucous membrane or maybe an open wound. The next link in the chain is the susceptible host. The susceptible host affects the host's ability to resist disease, and some of these things we may consider are age, the medications that a patient may take, the disease state of the susceptible host, or any kind of factors of malnutrition. <clears throat> so that is your chain of infection and how organisms move from one link to the other. As we go through the program later on this afternoon, we'll also realize that the chain of infection can be broken at several different points along the chain. And as we get to the end of the program, we'll talk about some of those very specific things that we can do that break the chain of infection. There are some other things that affect the chain of infection. Uh, in addition to uh, the chain, we also have virulence, invasiveness, and the pathogenesis of the particular type of organism that we are working with. Virulence, as you know, is the ability to multiply and grow. The invasiveness is the ability to enter a tissue, and the pathogenesis is the ability to cause disease. There are several different types of microbes that we deal with in everyday life. A microbe, as we know, is a pathogenic organism, and there are several of those that we may want to include, and they are specifically classified as either plant and or animal microbes. And we will take uh, a couple of minutes and look at each one of these classifications. Let's take bacteria first. Bacteria is a one-celled plant. Sometimes it's uh, pathogenic, but sometimes it is not. Uh, many b uh, bacteria produce toxins that are poisonous. And a group of bacteria growing in one place is referenced as a colony. Uh, again, they are, they are classified by types, but they are also classified by their shape. Bacilli are rod-shaped, the cocci are spherical in shape, and the spirilla are curved wall-shaped bacteria. Bacteria are also broken down into whether they are gram-negative or gram-positive, and this depends on their ability to take up any kind of resistant staining when they are stained with gentian violet. Viruses are very, very small. As we said, they are not whole cells, but they depend on other living cells for uh, their nutrients and for reproduction. There have been over 300 of them identified. Some cause infection like influenza, chicken pox, AIDS, herpes, and warts. They're transmitted through the blood and body secretions. Viruses are difficult to treat. Some of them are very resistant to the disinfectants, and they are not killed sometimes by antibiotics. 
They are called obligate intracellular parasites because they can only live inside of other organisms. Fungi. Fungi is a group of simple plants. They include yeasts, molds, those types of things. Most fungi are not dangerous, but some can be harmful to our health. The diagnosis of a fungi is usually done with microscopic examination. Fungi infections cause damage to the tissue by the secretions of the enzymes, and the, in the initiation of the inflammatory response is part of the damage that fungi do. Fungi usually thrive in warm, moist, dark conditions, and they cannot produce their own nutrients, and they must rely on living and dead organic materials. As we said, cutaneous infections, those, those are usually superficial. Those, like an example would be athlete's foot and candidiasis. Systemic infections include histoplasmosis and some of the pneumonias. The Candidia albicans is the most common fungal infection, and that is the type of fungi that causes the candid the Candidia albicans causes vaginitis and thrush. And about 90% of your HIV patient population will have Candidia at least at some point in time during the course of their illness. Rickettsia is another classification. They are usually smaller than bacteria. They are transmitted through the bites of fleas, lice, ticks, and mites. Several different types of diseases caused by the rickettsia. Uh, the, the, the typhus and the Rocky Mountain spotted fever are noted. Typhus is the only rickettsia, as you'll know, the infection can be transferred from human to human. Protozoa is the only microorganism classified as an animal. There are about 45,000 different types. Animal parasites reside in and outside of the body. Protozoa are constantly present in the intestinal area, skin, mucous membranes of the nose and the mouth. They are found in decayed materials contaminated water, unwashed hands, and insect bites. Some of the common diseases that may be caused by a protozoa would be dysentery, toxoplasmosis, malaria, and giardia. The next classification would be that we would like to talk about is hepatitis A virus. Hepatitis A virus is transmitted through the feces, bile, and blood of infected individuals. The incubation period is known to be about four to six weeks after the onset of symptoms. And the transmission is noted by the fecal-oral fecal route. That is the most common. There is an administration of the immunoglobulin before exposure or early in the incubation period, and that can help to prevent hepatitis A. Uh, hand washing and glove usage is also paramount when working with patients that are hepatitis A infected. But those are universal precautions, and we should be using those at all times anyway. A serum antibody titer of at least 20 milli-international units per milliliter is considered protective for hepatitis A virus. The hepatitis A vaccine is a category C for pregnancy and may be given if it is indicated during pregnancy. Hepatitis B virus. The symptoms of the hepatitis B infection include jaundice, dark urine, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and joint pain.
The hepatitis B virus, uh, OSHA also requires that employers, uh, that we look at the status of people when they are hired uh, for their hepatitis B status. If they have not received the three series of the hepatitis B vaccine, we need to make sure that that is taken care of and that those immunizations are offered. It is an, a group or a series of three vaccines that are given over a six-month period of time. A blood test can determine if the antibodies are present post-series of the vaccine. The hepatitis B vaccine is a category C level for pregnancy and an anti-hepatitis B titer of 10 milli international units is enough to provide protection against hepatitis B virus. It has also been noted in the literature that hepatitis B vaccine effectiveness is decreased when the injection is given in the buttocks. It's transmitted by percutaneous and mucosal exposure. Transmission is prevented by the universal precautions, and we need to use that with everyone, regardless of the status of hepatitis B or not. Personal protective equipment needs to be used appropriately, and then, of course, offer vaccinations uh, as recommended. Vertical transmission or transmission from mother to baby occurs usually during the third trimester of pregnancy. Some of the major causes of chronic hepatitis are cirrhosis and hepatic, excuse me, hepatic carcinoma. And the number of hepatitis B vaccine, the hepatitis B virus, I'm sorry, infections among the healthcare provider has decreased from about 10,000 in 1983 that was reported to just a little over 400 in the year 2002. So the vaccine has made a tremendous difference for us as healthcare providers. Let's look at hepatitis C. Transmission is through occupational exposure, vertical transmission, mother to, to child, sex with an infected partner, IV drug use is also a very common factor. It affects about 3.2 million people in the United States. Hepatitis C uh, is, is most common chronic blood-borne infection in the United States. Hepatitis C, there is a treatment for hepatitis C currently that has been approved by the FDA. This particular medication is called uh, Hiradon, H-I-R-A-D-O-N. It is taken by mouth. It is a treatment for hepatitis C. However, it's extremely expensive, and it's noted that it costs about $1,200 per pill. So that's a pretty high-priced treatment modality for hepatitis C virus. When you look at the hepatitis A, B, and C compared, this is an interesting chart. When it compares the size, the incubation period, the route of transmission, and, prof and the appropriate prophylaxis used for each one. So I thought this was quite interesting in that hepatitis A is very small, hepatitis B is larger, and then hepatitis C is somewhere in between. Uh, incubation period is uh, basically the same as you'll see for hepatitis A and C, but a little bit longer for hepatitis B. And then you'll see the route of transmission and the prophylaxis is methods listed there as well. Let's look at uh, herpes simplex 1. This is a viral infection. It usually causes some recurrent sores on the lips, sometimes in the pharynx and on the conjunctivitis, which is in your eye. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with that word. The incubation period for hepatitis simplex is about 2 to 14 days. The lesions usually occur at the same site from the uh, reactivation of the virus. 
And the transmission is through direct contact with lesions uh, and or infectious saliva. Herpes simplex 2 is uh, your genital herpes, the most common cause of genital ulcerations in the United States. And about 80% of the people that have herpes simplex 2 uh, do not know that they are infected. The wet lesions shed virus for about uh, 10 to 14 days. Herpes simplex 2 is transmitted only during the occurrences of the lesions and is more severe in women uh, than men. There's no cure. We basically manage the symptoms for herpes simplex 2. People with herpes simplex virus are about four times more likely to uh, contract HIV as well. The human and papillovirus, uh, it is one of the most common viral sexually transmitted diseases in the United States with about 5.5 million cases diagnosed annually. There is a vaccine that is available for both uh, uh, females and males. And this is a three-dose series that does prevent the uh, human papillovirus. Guardiaseal is the recommended uh, vaccine that is given for human papillovirus. This particular vaccine provides immunity for several different types of the virus, including number 6, number 11, number 16, and number 18. Guardiaseal also prevents genital warts in the male population that are caused by the same types or strains of the virus uh, for human papillovirus. Cervarax is effective against the hepatitis B 16 and 18 cervical infections. The hepatitis B vaccine, I'm sorry, the hepatitis, that, excuse me, not hep, the humulin papillovirus, excuse me, vaccine is a category B pregnancy. It is not recommended currently for use in pregnancy. There have been some situations noted with uh, syncope post-injection for uh, the HPV virus, so it is recommended now that the uh, subjects stay at least a 15-minute period of time post-injection to observe four syncope episodes. Here's a picture of herpes zoster and or shingles. Herpes zoster is a reactivation of the chickenpox virus. It's also known as we said uh, shingles. It's noted in uh, diminished infect, uh, immune inf functions. Medications and illnesses trigger the latent virus to be reinactivated. Symptoms of herpes zoster are tingling pain, shooting pain, uh, vesicular eruptions that follow usually that particular dermatome or down the, the spinal nerve. There is a one-time vaccine that is recommended for persons at the age of 50. The FDA has approved the, the shingles vaccine for those 50 years of age and older. However, the Advisory Committee on Immunizational Practices and the CDC has not currently changed their recommendations of receiving this vaccination at the age of 60. So please note that there is somewhat of a change in the age recommendations for this particular vaccine. Again, FDA has approved it for 50-year-olds. The uh, ACIP and CDC are still maintaining the 60-year-old time frame until some additional research can be done based on the efficacy of the injection. Well, let's take a moment to look at Ebola. We have learned a lot about Ebola in the last couple of years since the outbreak occurred. 
Ebola remains a threat in the West African area currently. Uh, one of the countries that, uh, there were three countries originally heavily infected with the Ebola virus, but Liberia has been removed from that particular list as a watchful list country. Uh, New Guinea and Sierra Leone uh, still currently have some substantial Ebola cases. As of February 2015, there were about 55 hospitals that have now been approved with Ebola treatment centers. The two centers that are closest to us here in the Montgomery area are located in Atlanta, and they are specifically named Emory and Grady Memorial uh, in that order. Most patients with fever and other symptoms coming to an ambulatory care facility don't have Ebola virus. But it is important that the staff members know how to identify and manage these patients who might have Ebola virus disease. So CDC put out some guidance for us to utilize, and it is part of one of the handouts that you have that you can download uh, when, before you watch this program. But basically the recommendation for CDC for ambulatory care facilities is that staff members should be able to do three different things. They should be able to identify, isolate, and inform when a person may come into an ambulatory care center with the suspected diagnosis of EVD or Ebola virus disease. One of the first things that you need to, to identify is to ask the patient if he or she in the last 21 days has traveled to Guinea or Sierra Leone and had contact with someone with a confirmed case of EBD. If the patient appears to be at risk for EBD, then you want to isolate that patient immediately. And that's where your PPE in your pails or your buckets are utilized at that time. Isolate the patient immediately. Avoid unnecessary direct contact. So you want to do this isolation from a three feet uh, space away from the patient or potential patient. Determine the personal protective equipment that you want to use out of your bucket, PPE level one or PPE level two will be the two choices that you have. And notify the health department to arrange a transfer to a facility that can further assess and care for the patient. We are only going to isolate patients within the county health departments should they present there, and then they will be transferred to an appropriate care facility at that time. Do not transfer the patient without first notifying the health department. These patients should only be transferred to a facility approved by the public health authorities. So the first thing we need to do once we have isolated this patient is to notify the, the health department to allow them to make the uh, uh, appropriate transfer recommendations and equipment for the transfer of this patient to the appropriate care facility. This is the handout that I referred to earlier that it was developed by CDC. It is on their CDC website. The title of it is, uh, of course, Identify, Isolate, and Inform and it is specific for ambulatory care evaluation of patients with possible EVD. So it gives you an algorithm of exactly what to do. If it's yes, then do this. If no, do this. And it's very specific. Our PPE Level 1 and Level 2 guidance was based off of this particular handout and guidance. We've talked a lot about 
all of the different types of things that we can become infected with, I think we need to maybe change gears a little bit and let's look at what we can do to break the specific chain of infection. As we have said, for infection to develop, each link in the chain must be connected. So breaking any of those links of the chain can stop the transmission of infection. Universal precautions is something that we have used for a long, long time in infection control and as being a health care provider. Universal precautions is the approach to infection control that treats uh, all blood and body fluid, fluids as if they were known to be infectious. Specific types of items that you can use to break the chain of infection. Obviously, any kind of barrier that you place in the appropriate spot does break the chain of infection. So the utilization of gloves and goggles and personal protective equipment are appropriate. Hand washing breaks the chain of infection. Alcohol-based hand rubs, contact isolation, airborne isolation, are all appropriate utilization methods for breaking the chain of infection. Another recommendation is the utilization of proper disinfection of clinic rooms and surfaces by using one or the other of the two items listed. The Super Sani Claws or the Cavi Wipes should be utilized in each clinic area to wipe down the patient care areas between patients and at the end of the workday. So if one of these products should be available in your clinic area for use on a daily basis. Hand washing, as we all know, is very, very important in breaking the chain of infection. Hands are usually the way that germs are spread. Uh, hand hygiene reduces the number of germs on the hands and limits the opportunity for them to be spread from place to place or person to person. The use of soap and water when hands are visibly soiled with dirt, blood, or other body fluids is recommended, but an alternative is also can be utilized if your hands are not soiled with blood or body fluids is the alcohol-based hand san sanitizer. Although microbial soaps are used everywhere, uh, they have not been shown in research to specifically decrease or be a benefit over hand washing with plain soap. So you may want to keep that in mind. If you have a choice between antibacterial soap and or regular soap, no research has been indicated that one is beneficial over the other. We do now utilize a lot of the alcohol hand sanitizers. You'll see them everywhere now. The, uh, the alcohol-based hand sanitizer is a preferred method of routine hand hygiene in the healthcare settings when your hands are not visibly soiled. It's easy and quick to apply. You need to allow it to air dry for it to be most effective and it is uh, seems to be a little bit more gentler on our hands uh, rather than soap and water. The CDC defines the alcohol-based hand sanitizers. These need to have at least uh, the 60% to 95% uh, ethanol or isoprel alcohol containing in that particular product for them to be effective. That is recommended for your alcohol hand sanitizer products. Again, I think we've already said this, but Alcohol-based uh, products are not uh, recommended for utilization when your hands are soiled with dirt, blood, or other body fluids. We're going to pause for just a few moments and watch a very short video on hand washing at this time. So uh, stand by and we will uh, switch over to that.
germs are everywhere. On toys, door handles, computer keyboards, coins, telephones, grocery carts, virtually anything that people touch. There are millions of germs that can make us sick. Many can live for several hours to several days on surfaces. Exposure to these germs often occurs when you touch a contaminated surface, then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. There are many remedies available to make us feel better when we get sick, but isn't a gram of prevention better than a kilo of cure? There is an excellent way to protect yourself. Hand washing is a simple and effective way to prevent the spread of infectious disease. However, to get the maximum benefit from hand washing, you have to use good hand washing technique. So for the next few minutes, we'd like to show you an example of good hand washing technique. There are six simple steps you need to follow for proper hand washing. First, wipe your hands with warm water to melt the soap. The second step is to apply soap and produce lather. The third step is to rub your hands together for 10 to 20 seconds to remove as many germs as possible. Be sure to rub in between your fingers, do your thumbs, and wash the back of your hands as well as the palms. Once you've finished lathering, rinse your hands thoroughly under running water to remove the soap. Pat rather than wipe your hands dry with a paper towel. Rubbing can chap and irritate your hands. Remember, germs can live on the handle too. Finally, use a towel to turn off the tap. More and more often, alcohol-based hand sanitizers are made available in public buildings. Used properly, these sanitizers can help prevent disease. Alcohol content should be between 60 and 70 percent. The sanitizer should be used when entering and exiting the building. First, apply a dime-sized portion of sanitizer to your palm. Begin by placing all five fingertips in the sanitizer in your palm. Then transfer the sanitizer to your other palm and repeat. Then rub your hands together, palm to palm. Be sure to spread the sanitizer between your fingers and onto the backs of your hands. Keep rubbing until all of the sanitizer has evaporated. Paper towels are not required. You should wash your hands often, probably more often than you do now, because you can't see germs with the naked eye or smell them. It is especially important to wash your hands before, during, and after you prepare food, before you eat, after using the bathroom, after handling animals or animal waste, when your hands are dirty, often when someone in your home is sick, after handling dirty diapers, and after sneezing or coughing. Help prevent the spread of germs. Wash your hands frequently with warm water and soap. When water is not available, use an alcohol-based wipe or gel hand sanitizer. And remember, a gram of prevention is worth a kilo of cure. Welcome back. We're going to talk a little bit about working with airborne precautions. Airborne droplets or dust particles uh, contain infectious agents and they remain suspended in the air for a long period of time. Air currents can move them and blow them long distances and some of them can be emitted from the person by during the time when they're talking, sneezing, coughing, or whispering. And some examples of airborne precaution diseases might be uh, tuberculosis, rubeola, uh, measles, varicella, and or chicken pox. Droplet precautions, those are usually propelled very short distances through the air. And they are deposited in the nasal mucosa and the mouth. And they can also be admitted uh, while a person is talking, sneezing, singing, coughing, or uh, during uh, procedures like suctioning and bronchoscopy. A uh, streptococcal pharyngitis is an example of uh, uh, a disease that may be caused by droplet precautions. Mumps 
is also a disease, influenza, rubella, meningitis, and uh, some, some of the pneumonias are caused by the, the droplet precaution uh, method of transmission as well. Let's take a, a, a second and look at uh, contact precautions. A little bit different. This is the most common that we are used to seeing. It is a very frequent mode of transmission for nosocomial infections. And as we all know, nosocomial infections are infections that take place in a hospital setting. Whereas the person is confined in the hospital setting and then has a, uh, acquires an infection while they are there. Some examples of diseases that we may get through contact precautions would be um, herpes, as we have talked about already. Infantigo is a contact disease, scabies. Uh, some of the gastrointestinal types of um, diseases are spread through contact, respiratory, skin, and wound infections. Um, direct contact and indirect uh, is the method that these um, particular disease processes are transmitted. Let's talk about some disinfectants for just a moment. The chemical disinfectants uh, are, are pretty harsh on your skin most of the time. Uh, so we want to be very, very careful that we are following the manufacturer's directions for dilutions of those disinfectants. As we all know, 10% household bleach uh, in water uh, meets the OSHA requirements, and it, it is very, very effective with uh, hepatitis B, HIV, and um, TB. Another mechanism uh, to be utilized during, uh, as far as disinfectants go, is you may want to soak the item for 20 to 30 minutes in 70% isopropyl alcohol. That acts as a disinfectant. Uh, we may want to use that for certain instruments. Uh, glass thermometers are not used so much anymore. I do remember those uh, of long ago, but the glass thermometers are, are not uh, utilized, as you know, much anymore, especially due to breakage and or the, the containing of mercury in that particular product. Another method of disinfecting is boiling instruments in water. We don't tend to do that anymore uh, much. Uh, we'll autoclave things instead of boiling them. But it is still an effective mechanism of disinfectant that has been used uh, in the past. It's, it is rarely used today. Disinfection of the clinic room, we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but just as another take-home point, be sure to disinfect the clinic room after each patient with the disinfecting wipes, and we've listed those there for you. Those should be available in your clinic area to utilize on a daily basis, specifically in between patient usage of the room and at the end of the day. Both of these products are available through uh, McKesson, and I think McKesson has changed over now to P P uh, PSS, I believe, is the mechanism, or it might be the other way around. But if you needed assistance with ordering these particular types of products, your supervisor or area nursing director can assist you with where to get these products for utilization in the clinic room. If you have an exposure, be sure, or blood, blood exposure specifically, but flush the area with running water. Report any injury or accident involving exposure to blood and body fluids immediately to your clinic supervisor. And be sure to complete your ARIA report. These are the references that I have used for most of the content of the program that we have uh, seen and participated in today. We are going to switch over now and watch just a very brief segment that was pre-recorded on the utilization contents and mechanisms of the personal protective equipment level one and level two. Good morning. Let's take a few moments and look at what the contents of the personal protective equipment buckets or containers will contain. When you look at the 
the contents of the bucket. The bucket will be the white pail that has a lid that is uh, for the top, and it is a screw-on lid so that it will uh, secure, seal, and protect the contents of the bucket. Let's take a few moments and look at what the level PPE1 and level PPE2 are utilized for. PPE level 1 will be utilized for when there is an interview at 3 feet of a patient that is expect, suspected of Ebola uh, disease. Remember, based on your handout that we have made available to you, when you have a person that may possibly come into the health department with Ebola, you want to identify, isolate, and inform. This is the PE that you will utilize for that particular situation. PPE Level 1 contains the following. There are two pair of gloves, extended cuff, a impermeable gown is located in here as well, and a face shield is located also in the PPE Level 1 bag. In addition to the contents of PPE Level 1, moving on to PPE Level 2, you will notice that there are different contents in this particular bag. PPE Level 2 is indicated for a situation where you would have to provide one-on-one -on -one care for a person of Ebola in, in the event that you are assisting with transferring that patient to an appropriate care facility. So the contents in the PPE Level 2 bag are, you'll have a hood, you'll have two long extended pairs of extended cuffs on your gloves. Also there is a gown located in the packet. There are long shoe covers or booties. A face shield is also in this particular uh, unit, and you have an N95, which, as you know, needs to be fit tested in order to work uh, correctly. So those are the two pieces that are in the PPE level bucket. In addition to the level one and level two, you will also notice that there are some additional items that are in the bucket. There is a small container that you can use for mixing your bleach. There is hand sanitizer, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. And also there is a spill kit for body fluids that is also located in the bucket. Once you have utilized any of the components in either of the PPE Level 1 or 2, you may put those items back in the plastic bucket secure the lid and dispose of the bucket at that time. So that gives you an overview of the contents and the utilization of PPE Level 1 and PPE Level 2. The nursing division has a uh, scheduled time, I think it's on the 21st of September. We are going to put these buckets together for you and they will be sent out to each of the county health departments for utilization in the event that you should need uh, the particular items that are located in PPE Level 1 and or 2. Now we will resume our regularly scheduled program that is in progress. I would like to uh, comment on a few other things that uh, were not mentioned earlier or maybe uh, go into a little bit more detail about some of the things that maybe are not um, new in the protocol but maybe have been clarified a little bit more or maybe that need um, some clarification. Um, one of the things that you'll notice in the, um, in the new protocol is that we have taken um, the latent out of latent TB infection. Um, now we, um, we're trying to all train ourselves to say TBI instead of LTBI. Um, that is primarily um, it's, it's a nationwide thing. A lot of states are going to this. It's mainly to make it, um, make TB infections seem like it's a little more important because if you think of something that's latent, it's kind of like it's not really there. 
um, like latent fingerprints um, and those kind of things. So nationally, um, the CDC hasn't really caught them, got bought into it yet, but um, some of the other states are doing it within their own program, and we have decided to do that here. We do. All, all of us still catch ourselves saying LTBI, but we are trying to um, to drop the L, um, and that has been reflected in the uh, new protocol in that everywhere that you would have seen latent TB infection, we have changed that to TB infection. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that clarification. Um, it's also very important for all healthcare workers who are, um, could possibly be uh, talking to the public or working with patients um, that have uh, TB or TB infection to actually know the difference between TB disease and TB infection. Um, this is something that we get questions about almost every day. Um, TB staff have to explain uh, the difference between TB disease and TB infection. So I just want to take a, a moment to kind of go over that. Um, many of you probably already know this, but it's always good to, um, to have a little refresher. Um, TB infection comes um, from someone who has breathed in the TB germ, but they have not actually developed TB disease yet. Now, you have to have been in the room with someone or in a, in a closed area for an extended amount of time um, with, you know, limited air ventilation um, to uh, pick up that TB germ from someone who is actually contagious with active TB. A person who has latent TB infection will have a positive skin, TB skin test or a positive IGRA. Um, the quantiferon or T-spot, and I'll, I'll go over that in a little bit more um, in a minute. They will have a clear chest X-ray. They do not have any signs and symptoms of TB, and they cannot transmit um, TB to anyone because they don't actually have TB disease. Um, one of the things that uh, is kind of a pet peeve of mine is when somebody says that they have, um, they're positive for TB. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what does that mean? You know, do you have a positive sputum culture? Do you have a positive chest X-ray? Do you have a positive skin test? So <clears throat> saying that someone is positive for TB could mean anything. And we will get calls. Um, I'm sure Don gets these calls quite often that says, you know, oh, my neighbor is positive for TB. and Do I need to come be tested? Well, you know, you, you have to kind of question them to see what what are they positive from? What makes them think that they're, they're positive for TB? Um, because having TB disease is, is a totally different ball game. Um, we actually will get calls. I think Don got a call earlier this week or last week that um, someone's grandfather was positive for TB and she didn't know about it and um, so she kind of had to do a little digging and, and found out that um, the, the grandfather actually does have TB um, and is, is currently in the hospital. And sometimes that's how we get our, our um, reports. Um, the hospitals and, and labs and doctor's offices have a 24-hour reporting requirement uh, to report suspected TB cases. But a lot of times family members will be the ones who contact us first because they are concerned for themselves and, and for other family members and maybe the um, it's not been, you know, they were just told that their family member had been diagnosed, so um, they will call us, and, and we often will have to say, you know, let me get back to you on that and, and go and um, try to find out what's going on. So it's really important if you're the one um, in the county health department that is taking that call and someone calls and says, you know, I, my grandmother is positive for TB, what, what does that mean? Um, someone with TB disease, on the other hand, um, they are um, actually sick and can be contagious um, depending on the severity of their disease. People who um, have TB disease may not be contagious at all. Um, sometimes uh, when someone is first diagnosed, um, they may have a negative smear but a positive culture, and that typically means that the disease was caught very early and um, you know, it has a better outcome. And usually we don't see a lot of transmission in those smear negative cases. 
Uh, we cannot say that that person was not contagious, so we can't just not do a contact investigation, but we can usually limit that to um, the closest contacts first, and um, you know, usually we see very um, much less transmission in uh, the patients who are smear negative and culture positive versus just being, um, you know, a four plus smear positive. That would be a uh, much, much greater possibility of transmission. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's something that's, that's very important, again, to know the difference between TB infection and TB disease. Um, getting back to the um, skin test versus the IGRAs, um, I think in the in the protocol it explains that a little bit about the um, the new blood test that we've been using. I believe we've been using the blood test for about three years now. Um, the blood test that, that the health department that's chose to use is the T spot, which is um, from Oxford Diagnostics. Um, the other um, brand of the blood test or IGRA is um, called Quantiferon, and uh, the two tests are, are pretty equal in their sensitivity and specificity. Um, the logistics of uh, using the two um, are really what prompted us to go toward the T-spot in that um, sometimes the settings that we're in, um, we need to just be able to draw one tube, whereas with the Quantiferon, it's um, three tubes of blood um, that has to be drawn and uh, then it has to be incubated for so many hours and spun down and um, then sent to a lab. So with the T-spot, you know, it's simply drawing the one tube of blood and then um, putting it in the FedEx. Um, it is very important that you um, make sure that you can get to a FedEx uh, office before they can, uh, before they close some of the rural counties do have some um, issues with their FedEx um, will only guarantee overnight delivery if you get the package there like at 10 o'clock in the morning. So um, we have had uh, in some of some situations in some of the rural counties where they would have to actually draw the blood and then drive it to the next largest city um, to um, that may be you know a couple of hours away in order to get it to FedEx to make sure that it makes that um, overnight delivery because if it's not um, sent overnight then the specimen is, is no longer valid. Um, we, um, I think Don uh, mentioned this earlier, we are not doing routine skin tests um, uh, not for the general public, but also for um, contacts. We have um, really um, been fortunate and able to use the T-spots over the, the TB skin test. Um, the T-spot and the Quantiferon both um, have a, they take the subjectivity out of the uh, reading of a TB skin test. I could read a TB skin test as a 9 and Don may read it as a 10. and you know, that could really cause some issues if, um, you know, if my child is a nine millimeter, do I want to think that they have TB infection and put them on, on preventive treatment? Or, you know, how, how would I want to um, handle the difference between a nine and a ten? Um, also, the TB skin test will um, sometimes cause a slight reaction and foreign-born people who have had a BCG vaccination, because the BCG vaccination, um, especially in younger people, can make a slight reaction on the arm. Um, I was uh, talking with someone recently about um, the uh, a lot of the foreign-born uh, contacts that we see will have some issues with you know oh they they can't take a TB skin test they always have to have a chest x-ray because their skin test is always positive because they had this vaccine as a child. And I was explaining to someone that that um, is not necessarily always the case because um, the, the use of these, um, the BCG vaccine is um, not to prevent disease, but it's to prevent a more severe form of TB disease in um, in countries that have a high burden um, of 
of TB yeah. disease. So the BCG prevents TB meningitis and more mm -hmm. severe forms of TB in, in small children. And I believe we have a question just that just popped up. Okay, the, this question is for you. It says, um, I've heard a lot about being careful not to overuse hand sanitizers due to bacterial resistance. What are your thoughts on this? I, I had anticipated that that question uh, may come up, and I did do a little bit of research on it as far as uh, in the senile nursing database. Um, the antimicrobial soaps and those types of things are not recommended currently. Uh, just plain soap, plain water is what is currently recommended based on the literature that I can review. So I would say just use plain o soap, plain o water, not antibacterial. So that okay. would be my recommendation. I can give you, if you'll send me an email, I'll be glad to reference, reference the two articles that I uh, gained that knowledge from. Be glad okay. to do that. All right, um, and please feel free to. Uh, we have the the email questions uh, that can pop up. We would be happy to um, answer any questions, or if um, someone from our audience has any questions, um, we you know would we had much rather answer questions that you need to that you're interested in rather than speaking about things that um, maybe are not as much of interest. Okay, at this time I have a, a, a comment first and then a couple of TB questions being new to TB myself. First, I just wanted to elaborate on uh, Teresa's issue with the um, shingles vaccine. As she stated, it is recommended by CDC for those age 60 years of age and older. However, the FDA has approved it for those 50 years of age and older. So people 50 and over still can get the vaccine, even though the CDC's recommendation is for those age 60 years of age and older. And just a um, little to remember that the, the vaccine is not to prevent shingles. Again, as Pam just mentioned about how they were given the BCG vaccine, it's just to help lessen those um, the symptoms if you do get the shingles. Um, also just a couple of other questions about um, TB because I was you know um, you all have taught me about the T-spot and all I was just so used to the old TB skin test. So are there any um, instances would you, when you would recommend or that people actually do give the TB skin test compared to the T-spot testing? Uh, yes, we have and um, frequently uh, we, are, if we're unable to obtain blood from someone, if they're just a hard, difficult stick, we would do a TB skin test. Also, um, with the T-spots the and, and the quantiferon, you can get results that are invalid or borderline. Um, our recommendations um, and the manufacturer's recommendations with the borderline and um, indeterminates or invalid is to repeat it one time. If the results are still invalid or borderline or indeterminate, um, then to, if it's a contact investigation, then to follow up with a TB skin test um, because some people just cannot, uh, they, they just can't get a, a result on that. Okay. So. Um, and I said um, earlier that we have uh, pretty much stopped doing the um, TB skin test. That is not necessarily always the case. Um, when we have had uh, prison outbreaks or uh, cases in prison, um, we do still, in most cases, not, not always, but in most cases, we will still use a TB skin test there. Um, one of the big benefits of using the, the IGRA blood test is that it's a one visit thing and it takes the subjectivity out of the placing and reading of the skin test. But in um, a correctional setting where you have a population that are not going anywhere um, and oftentimes when we're doing investigations that are you know hundreds or a thousand um, inmates in a facility, um, 
it is uh, more cost effective for us to use the TB skin test uh, because the, pro the price of the, the blood test is much greater than a, a TB skin test. And you have a captive audience, so to speak, so they're, they're not going anywhere. They'll, they'll be there to read the skin test in 48 to 72 hours. Um, so those, and sometimes in small children, um, some of our staff really don't feel comfortable. It may be a little bit harder for a, to get blood from a two or three year old. And, you know, we have made, um, made it known in the, the um, protocol that if you just can't get the blood to go ahead and place a, a skin test that we still will recognize all three. We just, we prefer the, the blood test just because it is, um, a, it's more accurate. Um, you don't get all the false positives that you can get with the, um, the TB skin test. Okay. I know earlier you um, elaborated briefly on the positive TB skin test and what I have seen is as I have been working in TB now that there are some people who will just document that the TB skin test was positive. They do not give the millimeter or what exactly it is, and I know that's very important. So could you also elaborate a little on what particular millimeter is positive for what particular um, audience it's or person? Very, very good question. The, um, there are three cut points for uh, a TB skin test to be considered positive. They base those cut points on the likelihood that you have been around someone with, with active TB. So the more likely you are to have been around someone with active TB, the smaller your skin test would have to be to be considered positive. So for a, um, someone who is uh, a co close contact to someone with active TB, we would say that a five millimeter skin test would be considered positive just because the chances of them having been around someone with TB um, is much greater. And your immune system, um, for some people, some immune systems may make a larger reaction, some may make a smaller reaction. Um, for the HIV positive population, uh, with their immune system being um, weaker than, than others, a 5 millimeter skin test would be considered positive for them as well because it's thought that their body may not be able to produce a, a larger reaction. For um, the next group, the 10 millimeters is the next cut point and um, people who are not, maybe not a contact, but are more likely than the general population um, to have been around someone with TB, a 10 millimeter skin test would be considered positive. That would be people um, like healthcare workers, uh, people who um, work in correctional settings, but maybe they're, um, they haven't been a contact, a known contact. Um, people who um, work in, I said healthcare workers, hospitals and nursing homes, um, for unborn people, we use 10 millimeters as the cutoff for them as well because uh, a lot of other countries um, that have a higher rate of TB, they are more likely to have been infected than um, someone, a U.S. born uh, general population. And then we have um, just the, the 15 millimeter cutoff is for the general population. That would be for someone who is just the, the average person on the street that doesn't work in a high risk setting that um, you know, it could be you know, anyone that's, that's just working with the public um, that has no likelihood that they would think that they would have been around someone with TB. Um, and a lot of times, an example of someone now who is recommended to be um, screened for TB are college students and um, when they're entering um, their first year of college, um, it's a TB screening is recommended for them. Um, different university systems will have different criteria, but um, most of them are requiring a TB skin test or one of the blood tests for um, their students, and 15 millimeters would be considered positive for them because typically your average 18-year-old new freshman college student has not 
really had um, a lot of TB exposure um, chances unless they've had TB in their family. So that's an example of where um, the general population would be getting a TB skin test and um, and uh, a 15 millimeter cut cut point with that. Great, so. thank you. Um, one other thing, have you had a, maybe not a lot, but some pregnant women who've been exposed or actually have had TB disease, and if so, what has been done for those types of um, people? But pregnant women um, fall under the same category as HIV positives. They are um, a case-by-case -case basis um, in the protocol. It, in my notes here, I had to mention that HIV positive um, TB follow-up is not really, um, it, it says in there to consult the physician mm -hmm. um, simply because every case is different and some of the medications that they're on um, may be contraindicated with TB medicines. Um, the same with pregnant women and depending on how close their contact is, if it was a household member, um, the screening, the having a skin test or having the, the blood test is still recommended um, if they are a contact, um, but it would be really up to the physician and the particular situation, the, um, how much contact did they have and what trimester um, they fall under um, as to whether or not they would be um, offered the preventive medicine. Um, it, we have seen cases of TB where the, um, the ladies right as they were delivering or right before they delivered did break down with active TB and it was diagnosed you know, while they were in the hospital at, at birth. And that's really a sad situation because we have to, you know, we have to take the baby away from them until, we find, until you know, they begin their treatment and are not contagious any longer. And I think there are some studies that have been done that says that show that right at that um, time of delivery and, and shortly thereafter, there is um, a little bit greater of a, a risk of uh, ladies developing um, active TB that have been infected. I haven't seen a, a lot of research on it. I know we have had that um, here in the state on three different occasions that I can think of. Um, and, and all three were very sad situations because we did have to isolate the mother and, um, you know, kind of limit the, the bonding um, mm -hmm. for a while. So that's, that's usually a very, very difficult situation. It's, I've had a, um, someone out in the field ask me at one time or another if when a person does not take their medicine, Mm -hmm. their TB medicine, then we have some repercussions of some things that we can do to help that per to encourage mm -hmm. that person to take medication and not? Yes. Um, we have, believe it or not, TB patients don't always want to be seen by us like, like we want to see them. <laughs> um, and in, in the past, um, up until around 2004, um, we did have a contract with the Department of Corrections that if someone was recalcitrant and did not follow um, our recommendations and did not take their medication, that we would send them to either Tutwiler or Kilby, um, and they would be considered free world, um, but be guest of the state in the medical unit at Tutwiler or Kilby. Um, and they really didn't have to take their medicine when they were in prison. We cannot force someone to take their medicine, but we can um, keep them away from others until they do take their medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and almost always they would comply, comply. once they were um, in prison. Uh, we stopped doing that, and um, we we're fortunate in, and are still very fortunate in that we have a TB compliance fund and that we can offer a lot of incentives and enablers um, to encourage people or to help people to take their medicine. Um, we have recently, and we've, I almost hate to announce this, but we will pay people to take their medicine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes just 
cash is gotta what do what is, you got to do. Cash is what is as simple as a milkshake. Yeah. They may yeah. want a milkshake mm -hmm. right. or Walmart, Walmart card. Uh, Walmart cards. And, you know, sometimes it's, will you stop and get me a burger on the way to, you know, mm -hmm. picking, you know, to bringing me my medicine and, and that kind of thing. So we, we do have the um, incentive and able um, funds available. Um, we had a um, contract with Cooper Green mm -hmm. um, in uh, where that they mm -hmm. agreed to um, take our recalcitrant patients, and we um, we almost had to use them once, but um, that person decided to um, to act right. And then when Cooper Green closed, that um, that kind of left us in a bind, and so uh, we have not really had um, people that often that have not not um, been encouraged by the incentives and enablers and um, recently we thought we were very close to having to um, put someone to isolate someone and we discussed with legal um, and uh, Dr. Williamson and Dr. Landers several different options that we had and at that time um, we did have a hospital that agreed to take this particular patient, um, and they would basically just be, for lack of a better word, just housing this mm -hmm. patient, and then we would have a, a paid officer or a paid guard outside the hospital door to make sure that they stayed isolated uh, until they were, were, you know, considered to be treated or cured. Um, and so. We were fortunate, again, in that that individual decided to do what was right and um, to comply. So um, most people will, if if you find the right thing, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes the it's right a trigger. sometimes it's a milkshake. Sometimes it's um, you know bringing a pack of M and M's for the kids every day, or um, sometimes it's just straight up cash. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just will really will do what we need to do to get the pills and the patient. Mm -hmm. w would it be fair to say that probably every hospital in the Montgomery area has a room set aside to care for a, a negative pressure room or an exchange room? I, I, think almost, I think almost all hospitals have yeah. a negative pressure room. Okay. Um, I know the larger, all the larger hospitals across the state have at least one because they use them for other other than TB, they mm -hmm. would use them for um, you know, other um, contagious diseases as well. Um, so, mm -hmm. yes, they, I know all the hospitals here in the Montgomery, in the area, Montgomery do. area do. I know in one of our rural counties, they do not have a negative pressure room, so they have a contract with another hospital to where they can transfer them right away, get them into a negative pressure room. That's great. So, so you need to know your resources. If you don't have right. that available, then right. know your resources of someone that can help provide that mm -hmm. service for you. So that's great. Yeah. Oh, we have another question. We have another yes. question. Hold on, folks. We, have a, we love questions. Do we have any XDR tuberculosis cases in Alabama, and if so, can we tell a little more about them? Well, th thankfully, 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 we have not had any XDR cases in Alabama. Um, there was one, they're very, um, very rare in the United States. I, we actually um, just had one a couple of weeks ago that was in the news that um, had been to a couple of different states. Luckily, we were not one of those states. And that person um, is being treated at the NIH right now. Um, XDR TB, um, the XDR stands for extensively drug resistant. Mm -hmm. um, the definition or the criteria to be an XDR TB um, case is that you're resistant to INH, rifampin, quinolones, and one of the second line injectable medications. Um, these people are extremely difficult to treat because um, if the first line drugs are out of the picture, then um, they are, are extremely difficult to treat. Um, and knock on wood, we have been very fortunate and um, mm. we actually got some numbers. And if someone's really um, interested, they can uh, email me and I can um, look up the numbers of how many cases in the United States. But 
I want to say uh, the last thing that I saw was like, I may be going out on a limb here, but there was like less than 50 in the last 20 years or so. That's good. Um, but unfortunately, some of the, the higher burden countries are not that fortunate, and mm -hmm. they do have a lot more XDRTB um, in those countries. And that's, would you say that's probably primarily due to them taking medication for a short period of time, then not finishing the regime? Correct. That's um, the same with MDR as XDR. You can, um, you can get that one of two ways. You can either get it by starting and stopping and starting and stopping and acquiring resistance, mm -hmm. and that's very bad. And that's one of the reasons why we do directly observed therapy on all mm -hmm. of our uh, TB cases, because if you start and stop, you can um, you can create uh, drug resistance. resistance. Um, also, if um, if I have drug resistant TB and I give my TB to you, if you develop active TB, you're going to have the same strain. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one of the big concerns with the. Um, the XDR case uh, recently um, in that uh, uh, that patient traveled a good bit and had a lot of contacts. Mm -hmm. So anyone that um, they infected would actually have the, the same XDR strain. And if they became um, an active case of TB, then you know, they would have the same really ugly disease to have to treat. And um, unfortunately, there are a lot of fatalities with those um, wow. those d cases. Mm. So. Any other questions? Get them in. We're running really close on time, and we uh, there's another program scheduled right after this, I believe. So they've got to do some rearranging here. So we uh, send those questions in if you have any. We'll be glad to try to find you an answer. I wanted to say a special thank you for everyone that's participated today. I appreciate Dawn coming down, and I appreciate Pam coming and sharing her knowledge base and being willing to uh, fill us in and, and take us through all of those little mm -hmm. that TV journey yeah. that we took. And Tracy's in the audience. We appreciate her area of expertise in TV as well. Uh, there are upcoming programs. There's one on HPV tomorrow evening I'm planning on watching, and I'm sure it's going to be very good. So please check your schedule. Those are, uh, there are lots of learning opportunities for you to partake. Be sure that you have finished your uh, paperwork as far as your sign-in sheet, your evaluations, those tools, those types of things we have to have in order to uh, give you the CE. Make sure you upload your CEs to the Board of Nursing when you're finished with your program. Check back with us and we will see you soon. We thank you. Thank you.